We are in Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to focus on verses 1 and 2 this morning, but I do want to read the first eight verses. And so stand with me, if you would. Starting with verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion of our faith or ministry, let us use it in, in ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Lord, uh, thank you for your word and thank you for bringing us here this morning and we ask God as we would study your word that you would teach us, Lord, and, and just help us to better serve you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You can all be seated. And so I entitled this message, Spiritual Relevance. And that's with the idea of that we're connected with the matters at hand. What the Lord has going on in our life and that our life should be really relative to what the Holy Spirit is working because we all members of one body, different functions. How's the Holy Spirit ministering through your life? What, in what practical ways does that work out? And that's why I kind of wanted to read down through verse 8 because there's going to be activities that take place in our life based on our thinking. It's going to start with the way that we think, verses 1 and 2. And the way that we think should be the way that Jesus would have us think, to have that mind of Christ. And so God has given us all giftings and ministries or service opportunities. And if we think wrongly, then some of us may be a, a wall you might say, absent without permission, or what is that? You know, oh, without official leave. Yeah, absent without official leave. A wall. Or maybe some might end up being conscientious objector, objectors, fleeing the country. <laughs> don't enlist. I don't want to enlist. I didn't sign up for this. Well, let's talk about that. What did you sign up for? when it comes to serving Jesus Christ. How is it that we're thinking? Because Christians who will not cooperate with the Holy Spirit are not thinking straight because God has put us to task. We have mission orders. You might say marching orders. We have been given an assigned place. And you know, the flip side of that is that that would be foreign to a spirit-filled believer to not cooperate with the Holy Spirit. 
And, um, you know, that might describe more uh, a carnal Christian who's more about doing the things that they want to do rather than what God might be showing them, nudging them. Because, see, God never puts, gives us too much that we can't handle it. You know, he's gentle in our training. And, um, but he is faithful to develop us. And so, and so it starts here in verse 1 and 2. You know, having our thoughts in line with God's will and counsel. And where do we get God's will and counsel? First and foremost, this Bible that you're holding. The instructions given is God's word inspired by the Spirit of God, meaning God breathed and given to us, and that we can go and read it. And if you read it out loud, you could say, I've heard God speak audibly. Just read the Word of God out loud. And so we can trust it. We can trust Him. And so in these verses, uh, those verse, verse 1 and 2 there, we have what's termed a conditional promise. And so this means a Christian must follow the direction of God, and when we do, then we are rewarded in the way that God sees fit. Not so much in the way that we might think that we should be rewarded, but in the way that God chooses to reward us. But knowing that we're doing those things that he's asking us to do. And so notice uh, the last part of verse 2 where it really contains the promise that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That you may prove takes the Holy Spirit, that you may prove that. And so you have to be walking in obedience to the Spirit that that might be proven or approved or allowed. And so, and so how that dynamic happens is that, that our testimony is showcased as we begin to follow the Lord filled with the Holy Spirit that the truth might be shown through us of those things that God is doing in us. And so when those would examine us and scrutinize us, that our testimony would then glorify the Lord because we're representing him and not ourselves in our selfish way of thinking. I remember when um, in, the, in the late 80s, I think around 87 or 88, when uh, uh, Raul Reese had opened up uh, a pastoral school for those who were already involved with ministry. And so they would accept 30. And so we all, you know, who wanted to go from all the various churches down in Southern California, sent in our paperwork, and then we had an interview. And I remember I went, Alandrina went with me to the interview, and so I'm standing out there, and they call me in, and it was Raul Reese and his administrator and, and uh, two assistant pastors. And so uh, just before I'm going to go in for this interview, oh, hi, you know, they met Alandrina and found out, you know, okay, well, bring her in with you. <laughs> and so she went into the interview with me, and one of the questions that they asked me is, Right now, what, are the, what is the biggest thing that you're struggling with? And I thought about it for a second, and I think, I, I think it's knowing the will of God for my life. And then they just all started laughing. And, uh, and it, was, it was great because I think I passed the interview because my wife was with me. She had some great answers for questions that they asked her. It was awesome go, yeah, I might be in because of you. <laughs> but I remember uh, answering that way, but now, through the years, that's going back some time, right? I have learned that I don't have to struggle with what the will of God is because the will of God is so practical. And he gives you desires, and he gives you opportunity, and he gives you means 
And so as long as you're content with those things that he has placed in front of you, you now are experiencing the will of God as you get up and you're obedient to what the word shows you to do, what the spirit directs you to do. You know, I was always thinking in, you know, in the clouds kind of, of this elaborate thing that it means to know the will of God. <laughs> when I find out it's just practical life. You know, I haven't, I haven't missed it, just living life and being responsible. And then seeing your life touch others because of it. Because the Holy Spirit can minister through you in that, you know, setting. My son, um, oh, that you may prove uh, because Christ is in you, that hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. Daily getting up, picking up your cross and following Jesus. My son Anthony uh, called me on Thursday. And my son Anthony, he's the one that um, was in special forces and, uh, and is now... Uh, married out of out of uh, the army and uh in school he graduates in in uh june as he'll be a nurse practitioner but he shared a storm he, he says dad i want to just share a really neat praise report with you and i go yeah he goes remember the neighbor that was living next door and having uh, marital problems and him and his wife split up and this and that and and uh, yeah, and, and so he was able to go over and minister into his life. They were both military, and, and uh, you know, there was that, that mutual respect uh, for, you know, where Anthony was at. And, you know, so they would kind of talk over the fence kind of a thing. And he was able to speak into his life and share things that he had gone through. And so, and he, one of the things he, he told the guy was, you know, you have to stop thinking about, how you're going to fix everything with your wife, what you need to do, because this guy was caught in addictions and whatever, you know, the deal was. He says, you need to get back to church. You need to get it right with the Lord and then let God do what God wants to do. And, and then he would speak into his life over months and months and months. Well, the praise report was, you know, a couple years gone by. He says, yeah, dad, he says, you know, because I had found out that their marriage got back together. They started going to church. Their, God was doing a great thing in their marriage. And then he was inviting somebody over that had the same problems that he had and guys from the church, and they were going to have a meeting to help minister to this guy who needed to be delivered like he was. And so he got in a conversation with Anthony. So Anthony, at the end of the conversation, went to give him, you know, shake his hand. And he just reached over and just gave him just a big old hug and thank you so much and and, and, I, and I, but what, what stands out most to me about that is his wife reminded him, do you remember when we were out trying to buy a house? They turned down full two price offers that we made on properties. And this is the house that God gave us. And look at the reason why God gave us this house. Because we had them to minister to. Oh, interesting, isn't it? about the will of God, oftentimes as well, this door closed, okay, you know, well, this door closed, and I'm not that smart. I say, Lord, close doors and open doors according to your will, and then I'm going to rest in the outcome. And his timing is always perfect. While, he, while we get stretched like Gumby, into a million different directions, you know. Because he knows how to mold us into the image of Christ. And it takes, for different reasons, it takes different, you know, situations for each one of us. And so, of course, when Anthony uh, shared that story with me, it began to remind me how many times God did that exact thing in my life. You know, my son's ministering to me this story, but the Holy Spirit is taking it to, you know, personal places. And I'm going, oh, yeah, and this and that. And then I thought also as a pastor, you know, and how our church family in the same way is affected because, you know, we've been praying, okay, Lord, open up doors so that, you know, we can refinance this building in a year. And, 
And I go, and I keep reminding myself, this ain't the church, this is the building. If God wants to take us someplace else because being in a different place will be ministering to somebody that walks into that building that would have never walked in this building that is going to get saved just for the transition. I'm thinking, okay, I forgot, sorry. Relax, <sighs> chill, because it's the same principle in any and all situations that God is going to be faithful. And so, now my, you know, not saying we're going anywhere, but, you know, the Lord may have plans that we know not of. Are you good with it? I am. You know, I'm fine with it. Matter of fact, I'm used to it. And so, <laughs> but this way of thinking is not, does not conform to the world's way of thinking. That's my point. The world doesn't think that way, you know. And, uh, but, you know, we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in these things. And so, in verse 2, the world, it speaks of not the earth, you know, speaking about those people that believe contrary to the things of the Lord, and it's sad how the world, they want you to feel like a loser unless you conform to the things that determine an equal success in their way of thinking. And that's sad. To conform means that it's a world, uh, the pattern of the world, to be swayed by the world, to be fashioned or bent or persuaded their way, not to be conformed to the world. You know, and I can give you an example, you know, take an example as, uh, you know, college. Well, college is good for, for some. It works, doesn't it, for some. But for others, it, it does not work. There are many people out there with degrees that they can't even use and they're into debt to hear um, and then they end up doing something else. So college is not for everyone, but the world won't tell you that, you know, because they make you feel like you're a loser if you don't have a, a college degree. And I remember... Growing up, it was even already fading off the scenes, but I heard more about trade schools than I did about college. And now what the world would say that the only people that become carpenters and plumbers and painters are the ones that were not successful enough to go to college. It's a warped way of thinking, you know? It's a strange way of thinking. And it's so sad that people swallow that hogwash. Because does that mean that God gifts us and places us based on the mores of society? Really? Why can't God call his children to do whatever it is he wants his children to do? They got to check first in with society? You know? Well, make sure you, you jump through all the hoops that the world says is success before you then do go about doing what the Lord wants you to do. And it's a warped way of thinking. That's conforming to the way the world wants you to think. The dictates of a worldly philosophy. Does God answer to that or should we? Certainly not. God places us where he wants us and has us where he chooses because we serve him and not the world. You know, and I remember hearing uh, when I was down in Southern California getting involved with the ministry, we drive down to San Diego uh, to a church, Horizon. It was a big fellowship down there. God was doing amazing things through, uh, through the pastor down there, Mike McIntosh. Happens to be the name of the superintendent of the schools here in Central Oregon, but that, that doesn't matter. But anyway pastor uh, down in Southern California, and we would go down there, and lots of people were getting saved. And then we began to hear the different reports about the lawyers that were getting saved, and the doctors that were getting saved, and the dentists that were getting saved, as just being some of them, all categories of people were getting saved. But then all of a sudden, doctors and dentists and lawyers were quitting their 
practices because it was so, what God, after they got saved, God just did a different work in their life. They didn't want to be a doctor anymore or a lawyer or a dentist. They wanted more time to serve Jesus. And it's like, what? That would not conform to the world's way of thinking. That's like off the charts. Why would you give that up? Because something more precious came into their heart and life. And they realized that it was all consuming what they were once doing. And God directed them where he wanted them to be. Isn't that interesting? I remember hearing also a testimony around the same time, a very successful a woman attorney got married and she got married and she decided once she got pregnant that she was going to quit her very successful practice to be a wife and a mother because that's the way, that, that does not conform to the world's way of thinking you know, you know, you get your Hillary Clintons that say, in a very degrading way, what am I supposed to do, stay home, stay home and bake cookies? Right? Like, like, what's wrong with that? I love cookies. <laughs> you know? You know, or she says something like, it takes, it takes a village to raise children. Oh, that's convenient. You know, let society raise your children. It takes a village when the Bible says, no, it takes committed parents or parent, if that's the case. That's who needs to be committed. But see, that's the, that the world throws out. But what does Jesus Christ want? You know, and yet God says to us that we are to obey him. And you know, oftentimes that uh, is very contrary to our way of thinking because not only do, were we raised, you know, with the big billboards of society telling us that this is what is successful and this is the way we should think. We have that all even before we get saved or we begin to learn the word of God and so forth. But we also have our own sin nature that we're dealing with that natural man, the, the one that, that wants to satisfy me, myself, and I. I want, give me. We have both. And so if all the ways we've been taught will justify the way I feel, we could be in hot water. That's why this mind needs to be transformed. Transformed. And so, how will we ever be settled in our service to God if we swallow hook, line, and sinker that selfish, self-serving philosophy that the world conveys. And I use that illustration, hook, line, and sinker for a reason. Did you ever see a fish that swallowed a, a, the, the hook, line, and sinker? It's a brutal, bloody mess. If you wanted to let that fish go, it's not gonna happen. The only possible way of letting that fish go is cut the line, and then he'll be carrying a little bit more weight. I've, I've, I didn't want to lose my, my, fit, my hook, line, and you know, sinker, so I jerked that thing out, of, and everything from the inside comes right up with it. I know that's a brutal kind of, but you know, that's what happens if you follow you know, the ways of the world and you swallow that stuff. You know, when I think of being transformed by the renewing, of your mind, it's the idea of change it up, renovation. I think of, um, you know, the Bible tells us in uh, Philippians 2, 3, where it says there, you know, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And so, you know, we have to be careful not to blame the world, not to blame the devil. You know, we have, we're, we're to blame for not choosing to do the right thing. And most of the time we want to point the finger at somebody else, but remember, 
you know, we were once of the world. We were once in darkness. In um, Ephesians um, chapter 5, let me see if I can find it real quick here. Yeah, you got it there. Ephesians 5, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So that's the instruction to us. You were once there, but now how are we supposed to walk? In the light, right? And, and so I know that, um, you know, a child is a good example of, of how we're bent to be selfish. And, you know, you take, <laughs> you take little, little ones, right? And you pour them both a glass of chocolate milk. What's the first thing they do? See which one has more in it. And I've never yet seen a child that says, here, you take the one that has more in it. No, this one's my Wait, And then the parent, you see, has come, oh, give me both those cups. And then they become like, you know, make them perfect. Okay, they're the same now. Right? I mean, I've seen it. I raised five children. <laughs> my youngest just turned 18, so. And, and so, you know, it's just that way. And, and so... But it's by nature we are selfish. And what turns that in a different direction, what changes that up and transforms that is the Spirit of God and, and the instruction of God that we follow, which is by the Word of God. And so when I think also being transformed and being renewed, I think of um, Paul. The Apostle Paul being, being willing to go into debt with his, you know, first charge account is the way I word it. But, you know, in, in Philippian, I mean, Philemon, uh, Philemon verse 1, 8, or 118, it says there, Paul writing, but if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. And so when I read that, I think about here the Apostle Paul who leads Philemon into a relationship with Christ. Well, he was a slave that fled from his master, which was a big crime in that day. And it's understood he might have even taken some stuff in the process. And Paul is counseling him, go back there and, uh, and, you know, go back. I, I think it's Onesimus, actually. I'm thinking Philemon. No, Philemon, he was to go back to, but Onesimus was the slave, right? And he ministers to him. He gets saved. Now go back to Philemon and turn yourself in, basically. But he comes back with this letter. Part of it is, if he owes you anything, put it to my account. I'm good for it. Now that is a different way of thinking. Put his, what he did on me. We don't usually think that way. And, and so, you know, it's the idea of, um, you know, in our society, everything's perks for us. You see that a lot in the credit cards that are offered. You know, get this new credit card. You get 1% cash back on everything that you spend. You know, either that or any cash transferences, no, no interest for a certain amount of months. Or you pay this interest amount, and you can benefit in this way. Just use this credit card. I mean, we never hear them say, hey, get this credit card, and all the perks go to someone else. Nobody would be interested. All the 1% goes to someone else if you get this card. Forget that. I want all the perks. I, you know, that's kind of what I like about my credit card, ECCU, is I've had it for 20 years. But it's a Christian uh, organization that issued credit cards at the time. I don't know if they still do, but it was for ministry, people in ministry. And all the interest paid goes right to ministry. So you know how you hate to pay interest, right? Well, this flips that whole thought on its side. Because, yo, okay, I can't pay that whole thing this month. Well, wow, I paid $40 this month on interest. Great. That went into ministry. Changes the whole concept, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's how it's been. 
But I remember when we fell on hard times. And I remember, oh man, we can't pay our credit card. It's like seven or $800. Then they send us the bill the second month. You know, how much we owe for our payment. Minimum payment doubled, right? The third month, send us the bill. And then the fourth month, uh, right around there, was like, you know, if you don't pay something, we might have to charge you a $5 late fee. It's like, where do you hear that? And my card was still good. I'm thinking, seriously? And then God delivered us, and we were able to pay it. I like that credit card company. But you just don't see that. And, you know, the thing is, the thing is, is, you know, um, people like to have all their ducks in a row. They want to feel like they're in control. They want all their ducks in a row like this. Well, you know what? Did you ever hear of sitting ducks? All it does is it makes for easy target practice. I like mine moving. All over the place. Hard to hit. You know, plus it don't collect dust or don't get stiff joints when it comes to serving Jesus Christ. You get two, two people want things set so, so much like this. They, the same pattern goes to collecting dust and stiff joints and serving Jesus Christ because they want everything in order. Well, I, you know, in all the years I've served Jesus Christ, everything seems out of order all the time. And I have to follow him by faith, taking steps of faith. What was it like Peter walking out of the boat? Those people that want all, everything in order all the time, they're not going to step out of the boat. Why? Because they're just not guaranteed. Well, as far as when I read the Bible, it, the guarantee is that he is faithful. Can you trust him? You know, there's, some, there's a passage in um, Proverbs 11, 24, that says, there is one who scatters yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The world don't think that way. But God says, no. You want to trust me? You want to be all in? Well, guess what? For you, that's going to mean increase. You know, Jesus, he says, and, and this is the, the mentality that we're we're up against, you know, in Matthew 6, 19, he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. I would say treasures, securities, comforts, anything that makes your life so comfortable is sickening. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, that's it. That's as far as it goes. And then you're even going to lose that, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Be all in where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Live on the edge. Give it all away to God, yourself. You know, be all in. Let God do what God wants to do. But the world places true value on how you will prosper and how you will benefit monetarily or selfish satisfaction that comes from enriching yourself. You know, he, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, really? The Bible doesn't teach that. It's, it's polar opposite. So our minds need to be transformed in that way. I remember when I was in college, <laughs> my one semester, when I realized it didn't work for me, and I took a philosophy class, social philosophy class. And I remember the subject, I was a very young Christian at the time. And I remember the subject had to do with self-esteem and self-assertion. And how you needed to, you know, be all about you. And some of the examples were where you go into a restaurant and the food comes and it isn't cooked exactly the way you want it. You send it back. This ain't cooked the way I want it. You send it back. And I'm thinking, a wisdom told me, even as a young Christian, I don't want my food spit on. <laughs> I mean, right? And so we have the advantages of the wisdom of God to keep us from being so foolish. And, um, and if ever you really have to send your meat back because it's almost raw, go back and apologize to the cook. 
say, I'm so sorry, you know, that I had to send it back. You know, everything else looks so good. I mean, do anything to keep them from spitting on your food. <laughs> because of human nature. We know human nature. You know, you can think what you want, but... So, and I remember that that right there was contrary to what God's word had told me to do. It was so opposite and opposite of everything that I learned as a young Christian. So in verse 1 here of our text, the Apostle Paul, he stresses the importance of this by wording it, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beg you of this. So this is the Spirit of God pleading through Paul regarding the subject that we're talking about. He said, we must present ourselves to God a living sacrifice. Present means to yield, be on standby, on call. Whatever the Lord wants, be living. In other words, be active, not dead. And sacrificial, offered, offered all up to the Lord all in. And it boils down to this. We realize and we understand and we accept. We no longer own our own bodies because Christ paid the price when he died for us on the cross. And it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so our bodies belong to him. Our lives belong to him. And so we, we need to stop doing our own thing. And when we sin, repent and don't make excuses for it. Don't justify it, but follow him. And this is what is meant by being a living sacrifice, putting aside our own will and replacing it with his will. Also, this is our reasonable service, verse 1. What does that mean? Anything else is unreasonable. To do anything else is unreasonable. And doing and serving the Lord is logical and makes sense as well, biblical instruction is the way to live. And then it's a reasonable service. And so in any way that we serve, God qualifies. Nothing is demeaning, because once again, that's the world. Don't believe it. You know, God, God knew what he was creating when he created you. Don't make excuses for it. Don't be, you know, swallowing that. That'll set you back as insignificant as it may appear, because we often get into the comparing thing. Look what he's doing, look what he's doing, and I want to be like him. You know, be who you are in Christ, and be all in, and serve him. And then in verse 2, be transformed. When you think of transforming anything, think of something like a facelift. You know, People get, I mean, you see it all the time, right? Hey, I thought the last time I saw that actor, they seemed a little bit older than they do today. They were transformed by a facelift. And sometimes they go overboard, you know, and they look like all of a sudden their faces are stretched like this. And, you know. But God does a work in our lives. And it's amazing that transformation we don't have no time, but about eight or nine years ago, a big group of the church when I was, our family was gone on an eight day trip, decided to go over and transform our house. Amazing. Eight days. They made a transformation. I mean, you wouldn't even believe uh, the transformation. We walked in, I was just shocked. New kitchen, new cabinets, new tile, new <laughs> appliances. I mean, it just blew my mind how our house transformed, even on the outside, the landscaping and everything. But bottom line is, is that that transformation took being unselfish. 
that transformation took work. That transformation took somebody that cared for somebody else. And I'll tell you what, the transformation that takes place in our lives will be because we care and love God and we care for others. It's not going to be because we're self-absorbed. That transformation, the renewing that needs to take place, will not take place unless we stop thinking like the world tells us to think and we start thinking the way God has instructed us to think. And then God would work supernaturally in us and freeing us up to enjoy the fringe benefits of living selflessly. A few more verses and then I'm done, but I got to read these couple of more verses in in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 5. It says, to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He was selfless in his life. And this is the way we need to think. And the, the idea of letting, notice let this mind be in you, is to have a willingness to fully cooperate with the instruction that God gives us. Because he was obedient in every way to the Father, even when it meant going to the cross. And then in Psalm 19, In verse 14, it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And let me give you just a word of advice. If you find yourself caught in a vicious cycle of praying only for yourself and only for the things that, you know, involve you, you know, you need to get out of that and begin to pray and care for others. If anything, put yourself at the bottom of the list. I'm not saying, you know, that you don't include yourself or even starting with yourself doesn't matter. What matters is that you care about the needs of, of others. Um, also in that process, you know, you have in Second uh, Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 where it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments or imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Once again, yielding to the things of God. And then lastly, and then we're done, in Philippians 4, 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So, being transformed in the renewing of our minds. And so, you know, just allowing God to have his way with us, to be freed up to enjoy the full benefits of walking in the spirit and being set free to do so. And so I encourage all of you, whatever it is, yeah, sometimes it takes work. So what? (laughs) You know, how many of you are satisfied after a good day's work? Yeah, it's good. Good day's work. The hardest part sometimes is getting started for me. But after I get started and get it done, I feel rewarded. I feel good. Well, the same thing happens spiritually. You know, that natural man is going to be lazy to the things of God. Well, you know, you got to get it in gear. They should come up with something that spring-loaded, something, you know, boot that kicks you. And then you go stand in front of it and pull the switch and it kicks you and gets you going. Sometimes we need something as practical as that in our lives, you know. Someone can invent that. But anyway, God's good. Let's stand. <laughs> oh Lord, uh, thank you so much um, for your word. And, and Lord, I just pray for all those that are here. You know where they're at and how they think and what they're doing and their philosophy on life and their understanding of you and your will and all these kinds of things. And I just pray 
Holy Spirit, that you have your way in each of our hearts, in each of our lives, in each of our families, and in this church, and that you would be glorified. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you need prayer, come on forward afterwards, okay? God bless.